You already know Loretta. That's who's going to be speaking tonight. She's been in my Bible college for over four years. She's now in her master's degree program. And what a woman of God. I'm telling you, we are blessed to have her here. She's gone through hell just to be a part of this church. So I hope that you're excited. I, I, she's going to give her testimony tonight. I think most of us are afraid to get up and say what's been in our hearts and really what we've been through. So I admire her for being able to do that. I mean, it, when God takes you to that place of brokenness, you come up and you are so different. And I have watched this girl change. She's an awesome preacher. I've seen her do it in prison. She's anointed. Even the uh, guards and all that, they're still coming to her now that she's out. The guards are still trying to contact her. How do I get saved? What do I need to do? She did Bible studies in the middle of the night with the guards even. So this woman, you know, there's a purpose behind everything, and I'm not sure other than she was there to get half the camp saved. Uh, I can't believe that, that the enemy would do what he did to her, but there's victory behind it. Every attack, there's a reward for it, and she has grown enormously. So I'm very proud of you. Come on, Loretta. Y'all would welcome her with you. Very scary to get up there. I don't know if I don't know that. So if you would, if you would just turn your chair around and face the black back. <laughs> I'm just gonna pretend you're all in white and in prison tonight. Are they trustees? I hope so. They're trustees. And there's no gates. You can leave when it's over. Well, Pastor John, I just I want to just the anointing is so sweet in here tonight. And if you needed anything, you should have just reached up and got it because it was just hovering for you to take it as free. And it's still here. It's not too late. Um, my name's Loretta, and I was born in Hearn, Texas, to Leroy and Joanne Willard. I'm the oldest of four. Uh, my family was really, 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 really dysfunctional. My dad was an alcoholic, and... My mother, he beat on my mother all the time. He never hit us, but he beat on my mother. And so she took a lot of pills and always tried to kill herself. And I would always hear kids talking about, I always went to children's church and things like that, and I'd hear them talk about Jesus. But I didn't see him anywhere in my home. And then um, we lived, like, right here. And then on this side of us was the Methodist church. And right here was the Baptist church, and on the hill was them Jesus freaks. <laughs> well, I went to the Methodist church, and it just, no offense to anybody, but it just seemed real weird to a little kid, and uh, still seems weird to an old girl woman. But then I went to children's church at the Baptist church, and I learned John 3, 16, that God so loved the whole world, not just one person, but he loved the world, and gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And they did the little felt boards. I'm going to show my age now. They did the little felt boards with Moses and the burning bush. And he made the little hand prints and the little boxes with the macaroni and sprayed it with silver. Why well, run across that field and give that box to my mother and she would act like I gave her the best present in the whole wide world. But I would always see these women in town with these skirts on and these buns on their hair. And they look so happy all the time. Not one time, but all the time. Like they're like, like they were just Alice in Wonderland. There was nothing wrong in their little, you know, they had all these rabbit magic, rabbit, magic rabbits, excuse me. But so one day I went to that church on the hill and I was nine years old and they was jumping pews and running and I was sitting back there and I was thinking, Pastor John, you would have fit in real good by the way. I was sitting back there and I just felt led to go up to that altar. And I went up to that altar. And I gave my life to God. And Brother Billy Sparks laid hands on me. And I hit the floor. And when I came back up, I was trying to talk to him. But it wasn't in English. I was speaking in tongues. And I didn't even know what that was. But when I went home, my mother only ever went back into that bathroom two more times. She'd go in the bathroom and shut the door. And I would look under the door all the time to make sure she was OK and still talking to me. And if she wasn't, I had to call my grandfather. But she only went in there two more times because I would lay outside that door and I would start praying, but it would be in tongues and she would scream, shut up, shut up. 
But I wouldn't shut up till she came out of that bathroom. And she came out of that bathroom and she never tried to kill herself anymore. Um, they've been divorced, my mom and dad, since I was 10. And, but I went through some things, you know. I was molested by a man and that was a deacon in the Methodist church. And even, you know, even he would tell me while he was touching me that Jesus loves you. You know God really loves you. And somewhere deep down inside, I knew that God really did love me. And no matter what this man did to me, God really loved me. And I made up in my mind, I guess, as a little girl, that nobody would ever tell me what to do again. And no man sure wouldn't have control over me. And I told Pastor Karen the other day that God took me to the scriptures that where he told the apostles, the, uh, the disciples, go get that donkey and bring that coat because they've never been rode. Never been broke, never had a saddle on the back. God told me about four years and I ain't never been broke either. And he was going to put a saddle on my back and he was going to ride me like sea biscuit. He didn't say all that, but let me tell you, for the next few years, he rode with me, baby. He every, every time I started to open my mouth, he'd shut up. Ain't got nothing to do with you, mind your own business. Shut up. <laughs> and that was hard to do because I was tired of people telling me what to do. I sure didn't want this voice inside my head trying to tell me what to do. Because after all, where was you when I was nine years old? And where was you when daddy was beating up my mother? But he was right there. He was right there all the time because he saved my mind. He saved my mind. And so I got older and I swore I'd never bear a man like my daddy. And I ended up doing just that. But this time, he, this man didn't do me like my daddy did my mama. He hit me one time and figured out he didn't like really do a slugger. So he got tired, he didn't do that. Because I had purposed in my mind, there wasn't nobody gonna do me like that. And so I had two children, and they're the light of my life. I have three grandchildren. Uh, God told me that he was gonna restore my family. And he told me that by giving me Isaiah 58 and 12. And I like what it says in God's word translation. It says, you people rebu will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the foundations of past generations. You will be called a rebuilder of the broken walls and the restorer of streets where you live. I will restore the ancient ruins that are long devastated. My life was long devastated before I was even born. And I got to pray in that scripture and I asked God, why do you want me to pray for my ancestors? Because they're dead. And I mean, they're the plus wasn't here, but their sins alive in you, Loretta generational curses we got we got some work to do and i didn't understand why i was in that place as long as i was because i should have just did three or four years and came home and i did almost eight but god just kept telling me i'm not through yet i'm not through yet and people tell me all the time i'm so glad you're free but i was free in there i just got loose they just let me loose and the devil's mad about that he is so mad but you know god sent people in my life. I look back now, we were poor. I didn't know we were poor. My mother made our life so rich. We didn't know we were poor. All the kids wanted to be at our house. We didn't have all these fancy games and stuff. We played outside. Kids don't play outside anymore. But we played outside. We played at Cowboys and Indians. And Mom didn't call us in at dark. We'd come in when we came in. It's not like that anymore. But I was in high school, in junior high, I was basketball star, cheerleader, track. You can't look at me now and tell, so don't judge me. <laughs> don't judge me. Still Victoria's biggest seat. And so I was when I hurt when I tore my knees up, it tore up a lot of dreams. I was gonna go to college, play basketball, and a lot of my dreams died then. But you know, I started thinking about things even in prison that, you know, talking about the valley of the dry bones. God don't speak to him. He tells us, son of man, you speak to him. We have hopes and dreams. It don't matter if you're 51 or 21 or 11. Speak to him. Speak to those bones. And watch your dreams rise up. Because when Brother Billy and Sister Patsy used to drag me all over the place, their kids didn't want to go. They were preacher's kids. They were mad. They didn't want to go to church. And I wanted to go to church because that big old Bible he gave me was bigger than me. And when I opened it, it read to me. I didn't know what it was talking about. I didn't know what the great horse of the apocalypse was or the, I didn't know none of that, but it talked to me. And God told me he loved me. And I remember laying in bed because they told me I was supposed to fear God. And I didn't fear God, but I would try to tell you I feared God. Because that's the thing I was supposed to do. I didn't know about reverential fear because I was just a little kid. 
but I knew I wanted to go to heaven. But back then they didn't raise up disciples. They just got you saved. And they preached that fire, hell, and brimstone. And you were scared to death that even if you got saved Sunday, you went back Wednesday and they preached it again and you get saved again because you didn't know if you were saved or not. They preached it so hard you thought you was a heathen and had to get saved again. <laughs> and then, you know, I was, I was talking about my ex-husband, you know. I was thinking about, I was always trying to play, live in two different worlds. You can't live in two different worlds. I can remember sitting on the couch and I would have the preaching on TV and the volume all the way down and the rap music playing. Here I am, I got kids grown, I'm sitting there. Banging my head to the rap music. And my son would tell me, Mama, cut that stuff off. Either listen to one or to the other. And so I identify with Paul because he said, the things I know to do, I don't, and the things I want. You know, I understand what he was saying because when the flesh is battling with the spirit, that's a battle. That's a battle. And you know, God is so easy, and I thought it was so hard. He's so easy. He just wants you to come just like you are. You can never get clean enough for him. Our best, our best, our best is just filthy rags. And I never thought in a million years I'd be talking to anybody because I feel like I'm going to throw up. <laughs> Pastor Don already warned me to throw up before him. But you know, the Lord gave me a scripture, and it's in Jeremiah 31 and 2. And it says, those who escaped the foot, the sword, found grace in the wilderness. And I found grace in the wilderness. I found a lot of grace in the wilderness because the penitentiary is the, come the, from the word penance. That means penance comes from the word penance. And I paid my penance, but God kept using me over and over and over again, even in my brokenness. And he took me back to when I was a kid. And we would walk all these old dirt roads and I'd see this broken Coke bottle or whatever kind of bottle. And you could just see all kinds of light coming out of that broken bottle. But then you could see a bottle that wasn't broken. You didn't see all those lights and all those colors. That's because he makes us broken vessels of honor. And until we're broken, you really can't use us because we think we got it all together. We think we got it all together. I never thought I had it all together. I knew I was jacked up, but you weren't going to tell me I was jacked up. So it took God telling me that. And I remember walking into the back of the day room area and seeing Pastor John and Pastor Karen. And Pastor John was doing questions and answers. And I was listening to him, and I was checking him out and listening to what he was saying. And I heard stuff that I hadn't heard since I was a kid. And then I said, well, I'm just going to see how much this man knows. So I started throwing questions at him about the red heifer and its prophecy. But I started throwing questions at him, and everything I asked him, he told me the answer to. And some that I didn't even know. And not only did he tell me the answer, he walked walk right over there to him. Well, no. He wants you to know right up in your face type of guy. I knew that he knew what he was talking about. And then I said, God, if you want me to do this, I'm not doing it without you. I'm not moving till you move. And I'm not going anywhere till you go. And so Pastor Karen started coming in and Susan and Deidre and all you ladies, Lisa, all you ladies that come in and poured into my life for four years. I never wanted to give up. I was just clinging to Jesus because he told me if you grab a hold of my hem like the woman with the issue of blood, if you grab a hold of my hem, you don't have to fall apart no more. You don't have to unravel anymore. And he began to use me. He began to use me in that place. And I got to hold those women and not just hold them and just like, oh God, I wish you'd shut up. Every week she's crying. Every no, I felt empathy and sympathy and I have been where they've been and I got to hold them and it was an honor, just like it's an honor to stand up before you people tonight and you're all my family. When I walked in here, I knew I was at home. This is home. This is the body. This is the body and you function as a body and every family has problems and every family's got those kids that you just want to hang up by the neck. But we're a family. We're a family. And when I came in, you didn't hide your purses. Last night, you didn't hide your purses or be afraid I was going to take something. You just loved on me, loved on me, and gave to me and helped me and helped me get on my feet and just continually loving on me and trying to see about my welfare. And nobody's done that before. Nobody's done that before. And it's the difference of being able to make it out here because there's girls that's already gotten out and they're already back in. 
And I, they didn't have what I have. And I thank God. They could have had because I warned them, don't go home. Go anywhere else, but don't go home. But you got to have a made up mind. The Bible says that an unsta a man unstable in a, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And that's true. That's true. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And people would tell me, well, God told me to do this. And God told me to do that. Well, if God told me to run around this building three times, then I'd be healed. I'd just, I'd just be, I'd die. Because thank God he don't work like that. You just have to believe in his word and believe in the blood of Jesus and the power of the blood and walk in your healing. Walk in your healing and walk in your deliverance and walk in your finances. And you can't claim a harvest if you hadn't gained. You can claim it all day long, but if you hadn't gained, where's the harvest coming from? Where's the harvest coming from? And you know, I've been, I, I, I've been, I'm a, the world says I'm a three-time loser, but I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm an overcomer. And there's people out here in the audience today, right now, that's more prison than I ever was behind the bars, behind the walls. And you don't have to be. You don't have to be in prison. You can give it to God and just let it go. Let it go. He's your vindicator. He's your vindicator. He's going to cause that man to turn himself in, I promise. I promise, because that's the kind of God we serve. Something's going to make him feel so guilty. That Holy Ghost. You think the hounds of hell stayed on us? That Holy Ghost. It's going to make that man turn himself in. God is going to right that wrong. He's going to right that wrong because he's our vindicator. He promises us that. We have promises in that word. We have an inheritance. But if we don't claim it, what good does it do if we have a million dollars in a bank and we don't have an ATM card? We don't ever go down there and swipe it. We just got a million dollars sitting there. Our daddy owns a cattle on a thousand hills. A thousand hills. All we have to do is ask him for it. Pastor John preaches prosperity all the time. He preaches prosper prosperity. I'm going to read the scripture one more time. This is the same scripture that I read earlier, but it's in, a di it's in a different translation. And it's the message translation, and I love it. It's Isaiah 58 and 12. And it's talking about a full life in the emptiest of places. Because if you can have a full life in the penitentiary, you can have a full life anywhere. If you can have a full life and you just buried a child, you can have a full life anywhere. And you can have a full life if you can still say I'm blessed and I'm highly favored and I'm claiming this house and I'm claiming this job and see God give it to you the next day, not even a, two or three weeks later, you can have a full life. It's all in what you say. It's all in what you say. What are you saying? Genesis, God said, let there be light. Boom, there was light. Let there be. Let there be. So why aren't we doing a lot more than there be? And why aren't we walking outside the next morning expecting to see it? If I'm saying let there be, I want to see it. I want to see it. I want to know that you're not lying to me like everybody else has lied to me all of my life. And he has proven over and over and over. His word says, put me in remembrance of my word. It's not because he forgot. He wants to know that we know. He wants to know that we know. He loves us that much. It says, if you will get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims. And I put in there, quit being a victim. Because do you know you can take a victim stance? Oh, poor me. Yeah. Pastor didn't shake my hand this morning. Wow. Poor me. The music just didn't sound good this morning because I was sick and couldn't sing. Poor me. I didn't get asked to fill this position. Poor me. The carpet ain't the kind of color that I like, but poor me. Victims. Quit gossiping about other people's sins. If you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. You think they keep passing you up at work. Start giving to the down part. Start giving out of the darkness. And once you glow, you'll get a position that you weren't even qualified for. They'll say, I don't know what it is about her, but I think she can run this whole company. Let me call her. Matter of fact, let me give her her own business. Let me give her her own shop. Because she's been faithful with the little, I'm going to bless her with the big. That's how that works. And it says, your shadow lives will be bathed in the sunlight. I will always show you where to go. I'll give you a full life in the emptiness of places. I'll give you firm muscles and strong bones. Our health. Our health. He'll give us health. He'll give us strong bones. You know, in seven and a half years in the penitentiary, I never got sick not one time. There's a $100 copay, and I had to pay it one time. And it's because I failed, and I had a red streak run up my leg. But in seven and a half years, I never had a cold. Did you ever see me sick? No, no. I never was sick. And that's God. 
that's God. This is 300 plus pounds, and I'm walking around like a 120 pound woman. I'm healthy. I may not can jump like I want to jump, but I'm jumping on the inside, baby. I promise. And it says, you'll be like a well, a watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build a new. Rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything. Restore old ruins and rebuild and renovate. Make the community livable again. If you don't care about your neighbor, who's going to care about them? And we're Christians. I want to ask you this. I have so many felonies we could wrap them around this church house from selling drugs. But I want to ask you this. Would there be enough evidence in, on you as a Christian to charge you with it? Would somebody say, oh, she's a Christian, I'm going to put her in jail. Would they find enough evidence to convict you? Or would they find you lacking? Would they find you lacking? I was guilty. I did everything they said I did and then some. I'm just blessed by the grace of God and his mercy to only go to jail for what I went to jail for. But that saved my life. That saved my life. You know, a lot of us as women, the Bible says that our afflictions are light and only for a moment, but we're drama queens. And we'll drag that moment out forever. Oh, pray for me. And if we don't get the reaction we want from one sister, we'll go to the next sister. Whether it's our problem or somebody else's, because we're busybodies too. And if we stop being such busybodies about everybody else's business, and take care of our own business, about God's business, be about his business, then he would be about our business. We'd find our lives so blessed and full, we wouldn't have time to worry about anybody else's life. I just want to say I love you, and thank you, Pastor Karen, because this woman has a heart for the people. I don't know how she does what she does. I have rode with her, and her phone rings off the hook. That's probably why I'm not a pastor. <laughs> My poor sheet's hands would be bit off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll just go shake places up and leave at the pastor. Yeah. No, but this woman loves people. And she loves inmates. That is her baby. And if she thinks people are coming there teaching us any kind of thing, oh, that ain't fixing to happen. No, you won't be going back in there anymore, not under her watch. Because we're her babies, and I'm probably old as she is, but we're her babies, and it's people like her, people like Susan, people, all you ladies that have poured into my life, my life has changed. I'll never be the same again. I love you, and thank you. God bless you.